<laughs> it is not live yet. Sunil will give a countdown. <laughs> We are live. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I'm here to uh, welcome you all to the uh, most awaited lecture uh, by Dr. Ramesh Kekunya. And this is regarding the most important topic as well. This is examination of squint part one. So now I'll hand over this to Dr. Pradeep Sharma, uh, who is chairing, uh, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Asha. I think we move on, on to this eye focus series of uh, strabismus online and it's been a wonderful experience uh, till now we have been talking about anatomy the physiology and the laws of uh, for the, the physiology and eye movements and now we have a very important lecture and one of the brightest strabismologists from india we have dr amish with us who is the network director uh, capacity building at lvpi he is the director of Child Sight Institute, director and center of technology of in, uh, innovation, and head of Justi V Ramanamma Children's Eye Care Center at LVPI. He is the, also the executive bureau director of the World Society for Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, which is a great advance that we have, uh, which is coming in the fields of uh, global strabismus. He is also the founder executive bureau member of Pediatric Ophthalmology Strabismus Network of India which again is a very good initiative which has been started and it also happens to be in the ISA, the International Strabismological Association. A very erudited scholar, uh, had, uh, has had 150 publications in peer-reviewed journals and a very good speaker, which is why he's going to tell us about the examination of the eye. And in two uh, uh, talks, this is the first one, we invite Dr. Ramesh. Uh, Dr. Ramesh. Can start. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. I'm very humbled. Uh, I'm going to talk about a very simple thing, but uh, for most of the, the residents, probably, I wouldn't say it's difficult, but uh, many people ignore. They, they ignore the power of observation. If you have power of observation, these things are pretty easy because you don't need a very expensive OCT or any kind of confocal microscopy to really see what is happening. So I'm happy to talk about uh, history, inspection of eye and head position, and then uh, determination of uh, and the measurement of deviation and ductions and versions. Uh, I will uh, present uh, a case first so that uh, you just, I don't know, I don't think so. it's interactive. So I'll just give a second for all of you to think what you see in this child immediately. Because uh, I am only talking about power of so observation today. So this patient, obviously wearing glasses, but what is most notable is that the child is assuming an abnormal head posture. The parents brought him with the complaints of oscillation or uh, rapid eye movements. And the patient is uh, keeping the abnormal head posture like this. I just wanted to show a video here of the same patient. We are trying to see. This is definitely all of you have, you can appreciate it, right? This is nystagmus. Anything you observe here? So I'll play this again. This is the nystagmus. Rapid eye movement. If you carefully observe the nystagmus, the level of nystagmus, both amplitude and the frequency, is much more on the right gaze than the left gaze. Okay, I'm coming back because this patient was diagnosed to have infantile nystagmus. And the patient has other things, which uh, he told he is not able to write as before. His handwriting is uh, deteriorating 
day by day. He's try, trying to write his name. Sometimes the teacher is not uh, understanding what exactly is going on. So coming back to this patient, this patient was diagnosed to have infantile nystagmus or the congenital nystagmus, what do you call, and uh, abnormal head posture, that is the right face turn. What we saw on the video was the frequency was much more on the right gaze and it's less on the left gaze. It's very, very typical of one of the problems in the brain, that is a CP angle tumor. We call as Brun's nystagmus. Obviously, the patient had the MRI. You can definitely see a very large mass involving the CP angle. I hope uh, it's pretty clear. It's even uh, causing a midline shift. Why I wanted to show this case is uh, stepwise and the comprehensive examination is important. Okay. This patient underwent uh, some kind of uh, excision and also radiotherapy. You can see the tumor size has shrunk now. And uh, he comes again after some time. His, the nystagmus in the primary position is stable, but you can still see the nystagmus is, you know, kind of still there, that typical nystagmus. And also he has this uh, typical facial opacity, which can be associated. Again, these are all examination which can happen with 30 seconds if you're observant. Obviously his handwriting has improved post-therapy. This is not uh, possible to uh, improve everything here with the CP angle, but to some extent it has improved. Second case, this is uh, diagnosed to have uh, blepharotosis, which is congenital. But the child is doing this and uh, they are so desperate to see. Sometimes they lift their lids also. But look at what is happening in the old pictures. This is not there since birth. What this child had was a very typical myasthenia. Because of that, there are other things which will not go into tosis part and all that. There are therapeutic kind of evaluation for ptosis and some are diagnostic. So if you see the diagnostic, the patient has a very good uh, lid crease and frontalis overaction. Why am I showing a lid in the strabismus? Because lid, pupil and ocular motility, they go hand in hand. So always remember LMP. When lid is abnormal, see the ocular motility M and also pupil. These are important to check. So this is one more patient comes with the abnormal head posture, right face turn. You can see very well, right? Everything was normal. No nystagmus, no refractive error, no ptosis, no field effect. But what was the culprit here? You can see very well significant scratch on the glasses. So abnormal head posture is not always due to strabismus. Just remember that we have to observe other things as well. This is typically uh, nystagmus with abnormal head posture to right side and also left side. We call it, call it as periodic alternating nystagmus. So the first part of the thing with these cases, I would like to come is the history taking. What history taking we should be taking in a case of uh, strabismus? Uh, strabismus is one of the symptoms or one of the ocular manifestation of many diseases which can happen. Most of us think that it's committed, it is benign. But when a case comes, you have to derive and come to a conclusion that it's committent or incommitent. Is it a benign committent or is it something really dangerous? Sometimes it can be life-saving. Sometimes it can be sight-saving. So you need to remember. So the birth history and developmental history is a mandatory thing in all the patients. Uh, in most of the committent strabismus, I would say, even if they come late during their adulthood. 
Duration and progression is a part and parcel of any history taking. What's the duration of the strabismus, whether it is progressing, whether it is associated with double vision. Double vision is very, very important to ask. With this, you can come to a conclusion, whether it is horizontal or vertical, or is it torsional? Depending upon that, you can come to a conclusion. And three other associations I have put here, which uh, you, you wouldn't ask in every patient, but most of the patients you need to ask for the systemic condition, like infantile isotropy with these uh, patient comes. You need to ask for neurological association, whether there is any developmental delay or whether there is any systemic disease like Down syndrome. A patient coming with the double vision, you need to ask the, whether the patient has any thyroid eye disease, hypertension, diabetes, all these things becomes important because most of us as a resident or general practitioners, what we see double vision is most often it's because of trauma, traumatic palsy, or because of any kind of ischemia due to hypertension and diabetes. Most commonly, ischemic sixth nerve palsy and ischemic third no palsy. And obviously, in elderly patients, we also have to think about any kind of aneurysm. So it's a plethora of disease which can present as strabismus. In the birth history and development, you know, it can be congenital cataract, unilateral cataract coming as a strabismus. Sometimes it can be retinoblastoma, very rarely. These are all manifestations. So they don't come with uh, these kind of things. So you need to do, why am I stressing on this part is, just don't do strabismus evaluation. Do a complete history. Look at systemic neurological and other ocular association. And then go to a kind of examination. Once you have this in uh, place, then you can think about which way I'm going. Okay, there is no neurological association. It's good. The patient does not have seizures, headache, vomiting. So I'm kind of ruling out a neurological cause. Not always, but most of the times. Whether the patient has diplopia or not. Whether the patient had any prior ocular surgery. History taking also is important in terms of any previous ocular or non-ocular surgery, including strabismus surgery in the past. This is also uh, for us to see because sometimes strabismus uh, surgery history is not taken, then we will associate uh, you know, with some neurological disease. This has to be taken. So I have just put seven points here, but I can just talk about history taking with different examples for half an hour, which we can all do for any kind of disease. But on uh, top of your mind, just think about developmental history, birth history, duration, progression, associated double vision is there or not. And then three types of association, systemic, neurological, and any ocular association. And this is important as being a pediatric ophthalmologist or strabismologist, you need to have. This patient is crying and crying. He is not able to, allowing us to do anything. You know, cover test is not possible all the time. But you can have surrogate measures. Like you can have a simple toy like this, which, is, which can be there in your pocket. We can make sure that child is attentive. Sometimes even you have to use your thumb to do a cover test. It's not possible to get everything like cover test, uncover test, prism cover test, alternate cover test, ocular motility, ductions and versions. It's not possible. It's ideal. It's not possible in uh, these kind of children, which is not most of the kids, they cooperate, but some kind of toys, it's always handy. Uh, I will come to a bit uh, in the abnormal head posture. I would like to show some more. Before that, the residents most often get confused with squint means cover, uncover, alternate, latent, manifest, and fusion. With these six words, 
their uh, what i go and spinning in the head already starts but one thing i must tell you which uh, happened to all of us when we were residents while reading stabismus you understand everything what is arc what is uh, nra what is amplitude of accommodation everything but the minute you complete three or four days when a patient comes and sitting in front of your you know clinic or in front of your chair uh you think okay simple can you tell me what is cover test and uncover test it gets confusing and confusing why the basic reason is you don't apply it so these tests uncovering the cover test is not difficult i am going to show some videos by the today and maybe in the next class but you need to understand what you are doing and why you are doing and it just again observation only thing what moves is your hand and the cover with that your eyes also moves with that you need to come to a conclusion what it is i basically always for the ease of understanding i kind of classify strabismus and ocular motility evaluation both in kids and in adults as diagnostic test and therapeutic test our uh, textbook says in a different way but for ease of understanding diagnostic is like okay whether the patient has esotropia yes patient has esotropia is it comitant or incomitant when you see that incomitant if you see retraction it's mostly towards duan retraction if you see any kind of uh, nystagmus you go in terms of nystagmus and uh, strabismus so hirschberg hbt is hirschberg test cover test and motility especially these are the diagnostic test in terms of therapeutic test you need to know what is happening like you have given a therapy for some patient ocular myasthenia for example patient has hypertropia it was 15 to begin with you need to measure it next time when he comes okay it has come down to 7 that's good that the patient is recovering you have to do a surgery for a 30 pd when the post op patient comes you need to do this prism cover test and when you are doing more and more uh, therapeutic test you don't care about cover test uncover test it's not really practically required what you do mostly is prism cover test and then if the vision is very poor then you do crims case test so but one thing when you are doing a evaluation of strabismus in a child it's always visual acuity estimation as well sometimes uh, you know when you put your thumb you are doing it for uh, you know eliciting the direction of the ocular movement but also you can check whether the fixation is central steady or maintained it's not that in infants and toddlers you cannot separate visual acuity estimation and also strabismus evaluation so they go hand in hand both uniocular as well as binocular you will get uh, with the rapidity of fixation you will know whether the patient has um, amblyopia or lazy eye as well and if you can't get all the information patch one eye and then see the response maybe pass the worse eye first and then do the other eye i'm not going to talk about visual acuity estimation in children especially in infants and toddlers but this factor you need to keep it in mind before you decide on what test to do again i said the inspection and observation is very very important this we have heard from mbbs days in any disease it's not applying to strabismus you may have a patient with proptosis with thyroid eye disease eye disease he may be walking like that you may have ocular myasthenia or you may have a third nerve palsy or a supranuclear palsy by the way they walk you can imagine or understand why this patient has come 
that kind of checklist that kind of uh, you know uh, i wouldn't say artificial intelligence you need to acquire this by seeing 100 plus or 200 plus patients this has to go in when they come to your uh, clinic for example there are face turn patients here so the first patient is because of the cystic sarcosis in the muscle he is having the left uh, the face turn to the right and you can also see the congestion there face turn is not always because of uh, nystagmus as you can see in the uh, the the child on the right side that child has nystagmus and the lower most child has a right face turn this patient has duan syndrome with which the patient has come so inspection is important don't uh, come to a conclusion okay patient has abnormal head posture this is right so definitely patient has a six nerve palsy don't conclude that go to hirschberg reflex test go to cover test for distance near ocular motility that way we should plan but uh, i must tell you one thing that uh, if you want to check have a systemic approach visual equity should be first most of the times because uh, sometimes visual equity and stereopsis can be changed once you occlude the eyes so that's important and look at this patient these are all when they come into your clinic or inside your uh, examination room you can see a big head tilt whenever somebody has a head tilt if they have acute condition you will think about skew deviation or anything like that but most commonly what do you think patient has superior oblique palsy if they have superior oblique palsy what they have they will have one eye at the higher level hypertropia if they don't have sometimes dvd like this the patient can have we will go through the cases later but i just want you to understand what is the importance sometimes you may not be able to elicit this abnormal head posture parents have to give you photographs or nowadays most of them have photographs and uh, you can also look at the videos sent by them it's a typical left head tilt it's a congenital superior oblique palsy this patient had and then we had to intervene and these are the pre and post op pictures she was not even allowing her us to uh, do you know estimation in the clinic but always we used to depend on the pictures sent by but how do you do surgery in a kid and infants and toddlers sometimes you will have to base your surgery on uh, krimsky test or hirschberg reflex test and the ocular motility or the combination so uh, most of the times you will be able to do the cover test but sometimes you will not be able to do. i just wanted to give this uh, or you one of my fellow ajinkya have prepared this algorithm for abnormal head posture the first case there is because of scleritis when they have scleritis they can have pain because of that they may not move and the second uh, case was because of oblique astigmatism with the pinhole you can see that it has improved the third picture on that she has a chin down position because of uh, Uh, she had refractive accommodative dystopia once we gave glasses she became all right fourth case where you can see the visual field defect she had that kind of abnormal head posture she had uh, resolution of this uh, hemorrhage in the parieta occipital region and then it improved the fifth row you have already seen abnormal head posture which because of the glasses scratches in the glasses optical this you need to remember all the time so it, it, it's it's strabismus it's nystagmus it's a, any kind of infection it's refractive error and the last picture you can see chin elevation because of the ptosis so what's the algorithm whenever you see these are all good to have this on your uh, you know presentation close eyes one eye always see whether uh, closing one eye abnormal head posture persists this is the simplest thing you can do in your clinic that's mainly because of 
orthopedic reason. If it disappears uh, on supine uh, position, then you need to check. You know, if it disappears means it's something ocular. If it disappears and if it persists, even in supine position, it's ocular. Otherwise, it's vestibular. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. So then if it is ocular, do the patch test and uh, if it is worsening and uh, look at whether it is improving with the pinhole test, all that you can do it with just looking at whether it is persisting or closing one eye. This way you can come to a conclusion. Once you do this everything, it can be optical also which you need to look at other tests in this uh, kind of situations. So other points you need to remember is the uh, position of the lids. Lids and the globe position is very important. So in this patient, you can see the patient has a very broad nasal bridge and also epicanthal folds, very typical feature of pseudo esotopia. In this patient, what is happening? The, the patient looks like there is exotopia. This is because of the angle kappa abnormality. Positive or negative can lead on to this pseudo strabismus picture. But once you do cover test, she does not have any kind of uh, deviation. Here, what you can see is the lateral canthus is little bit upward. And also the position of the lids, the lower lid, if you see, it usually has a curve. What is happening in her, her case is it is almost straight. Compare the upper lid and the lower lid, these positions also can give rise to, because these are all part of inspection, observation, abnormal head posture, facial features. Sometimes the patient can have a frontal bossing or hydrocephalus or they can have a craniosynostosis where there is a you know, abnormal skull uh, uh, shape. With that also, they can have strabismus. So these are all different aspects uh, what we need to see. Uh, this patient, if you see what is what you can see, immediately what you can see is this size outward and also there is upward moment of this side. This is the way she looks. But if you case, look carefully, what else is there? Look at the position of the medial canthus. Look at the position of the lateral canthus. Medial canthus, lateral canthus. She has this anti-mongolite gland. Why it is important? With this change in this gland, they can have Path of the extraocular muscles can be different. We call it as heterotopia, heterotopia of the pulleys and the path of the muscles. With that, they can have a pattern strabismus. As you can see, this girl had uh, that kind of pattern where there is 35 prisms of exotropia in upgaze, which increased to almost 55. It's not that uh, you need to, because this, this observation, whatever I showed, it takes 10 or 15 seconds before you do things. Don't directly get into the business of doing cover test or Hirschberg reflex test. Spend at least 20, 30 seconds. Once you have seen many cases, it becomes uh, easy to kind of uh, incorporate in your checklist. Okay, let me look at face. It applies even if you keep a patient over a strict lamp. Just look at. Don't just look at cornea or cataract. Just look around. You will <clears throat> get the answer most of the times. <clears throat> Excuse me. What you can see here is I'm using a translucent occluder here. Under the occlusion, the occluded eye, you can see the eye is going up and also out. When I change it to the left eye, now the left occluded eye also is going out and it's also going up. 
but the but the amount of deviation is not so much so when there is a differential amount of deviation what do you call it could be because of paresis or incompetence or it can be because of the dissociated strabismus as in this case you are getting a dissociated amount of uh, you know uh, the amount of deviation with the right eye occlusion and left eye occlusion many people do a cover test in one eye and leave it you need to do this kind of uh, check also when you are trying to do this uh i think i will uh, take this light reflex test and then probably we can take some questions and then uh, we can continue the part two yeah so in terms of uh, is it okay asha yes sir okay yeah. perfect so with regards to the light reflex most of us uh, use this light maybe a strict lamp light or indirect but what you need is a very good torch light as a resident or as a practitioner you need to have a torch light which is um, very small pen torch which should not have any kind of scotoma scantra central scotoma most of the torch if you use a big one it will have a central scotoma so you need to carry it wherever because the torch light gives a lot of information but as a strabismus evaluation hirschberg test you can also look at the uh, angle kappa how it is uh, seen because that is a part which can be seen in uh, hirschberg reflex test but when you do a cover test you may not have anything so positive and negative angle kappa it's very important and krimsky test and modified krimsky test again you use light source and then check the deviation and bruckner test you need to use a some kind of uh, direct ophthalmoscope or any kind of uh, ophthalmoscope to have that so this is what it is you can see uh, it's a oblique picture taken it's not a end to end picture that's why i don't think that we are sitting obliquely whenever you are uh, checking this you need to directly in front of the patient you need to sit at the level of the child or the patient and you is a point source of light and see where the reflex is falling in the right side and also on the left side mostly if they have a uh, strabismus in the eye the dominant eye it will be at the center not exactly at the center little bit deviation will be there and then all of you know 7 degrees 15 degrees and 30 degrees between the pupil border and the, the limbus but it's also important and the visual axis and the pupillary axis it can be positive and negative both can lead to esotopia pseudo esotopia or pseudo exotopia so this is close to limbus i directly know what this patient has this patient has a esotropia you can see the reflex where exactly it's falling not exactly at the limbus the problem with this hirschberg reflex is sometimes if the patient has very large strabismus it will have the reflex on the sclera you may not be able to clearly see that even a hirschberg reflex has to go beyond that's what we are trying to calibrate beyond the limbus if it falls what the kind of amount of deviation we are coming up with the algorithm it's not so difficult we can add another 15 degrees or so so sometimes we have 100 or 120 degrees of strabismus or not 120 uh probably 90 is the maximum what i have seen looking at the medial uh, wall of the orbit so it can be close to 120 prisms or 140 prisms sometimes so you can only measure 50 prisms in the in your set or 95 prisms so that's about it uh, this is krimsky test uh, asha i'll stop at uh, krimsky test and then we can take some uh, questions questions absolutely questions line crims crims yeah 
Krimsky and uh, modified Krimsky is uh, something like, which is a very important. Krimsky is straightforward. You have good eye vision in one eye. In this case, the right eye has good vision, 6-6. Six, six. Left eye has a very poor vision. There are some prerequisites to do a cover test. Number one, they should have a relatively good vision. Probably I would say whatever the maximum chart in your, um, you know, uh, uh, vision chart, they can read 2200 or so. Second thing is, it's important that they have a central fixation. It's not that they have a ROP drag because of the macula or the coloboma punched out scar. Then you will keep on measuring, but you will not find the neutralizing point. Central fixation, uh, good vision, good ocular motility. Sometimes in six norm palsy, if it is coming up till midline, you can uh, still measure it. But if the eye is not even coming to the midline, you cannot measure. So in these kind of situations, you can do this Krimsky test. Krimsky is when I place the prism in the non-dominant eye or the squinting eye, as you can see in the first picture. Modified is when I put it on the normal eye, and see the centration of the squinting eye. Practically, I think modified Krimsky is uh, very useful because if you use the prism directly, you will have a parallax error created by that. You may not be able to see where exactly is the centration. So by using a prism in the normal eye, you keep on increasing till you see the centration of the left eye, as in this case, left eye has esotopia. So we are using a base out prism in that uh, case. I'll just uh, show this video how to perform this Krimsky's test and then we can go for questions. So this is the same patient, whatever picture I showed. Cover test, you can see that oblique movement, some kind of uh, fixation error there. This is Krimsky's test. I'm keeping on increasing. I can't see the centration. You can see even now it is not central. I'm doing a modified crimp scheme now. Maybe, maybe I need to increase a little bit more. Now you can see that I is centered. This is a approximate. It's not, it's not a guesstimate. It's an approximate amount of stabismus. We can now check with this. Yeah, that's all I had uh, for, for today. We can do the cover test and uh, other different types of tests which are involved in motor test in the next class. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was a uh, very illustrative lecture with all the videos and the pictures. Uh, uh, so we have few questions and also I wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Sony and Dr. Uh, Praveen. They are our hot seats for today. Sony is a uh, final year uh, MS at Shadan Institute of Medical Sciences. She has a question for you. Uh, what is the time to patch the eye for deceased and normal eye to inter in interpret? Okay. <clears throat> this is... Uh... Basically, you are asking what is the time of disruption of a fusion? It is required to elicit uh, the amount of strabismus or amount of latent or intermittent strabismus. Uh, Dr. Sony, you can ask no? the question directly. Okay. Yes. They can. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Good evening. Sir, good evening. Uh, sir uh, I wanted to know the time to patch the eye for interpretation in like what is the time for normal eye and what is the uh, time for the other eye deviated eye to know that uh, clearly to know the okay see normal. the thing it's 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 not like normal eye and uh, abnormal or squinting eye sony we need to do which situations let us understand where do you need this patch test if a patient comes with, the, as I showed in my uh, Krimsky's test, patient has very poor vision, has a manifest deviation, definitely it's there. Probably we don't have to do the patch test. Where it is required, you know, patient is coming to you with the intermittent exotopia. Sometimes you can see the eyes are deviating. 
sometimes it's perfect these kind of situations to get the maximum amount of deviation generally a 40 minute uh, patch of one of the eye is required it is not about normal or abnormal eye when any eye you can patch and uh, wait for 40 minutes and call them again having said that for practical purpose you can do it for 20 to 30 minutes also when i was doing a fellowship in us or some of my mentors used to do a kind of a half day patch or overnight patch and directly come so these are variable but i would say 40 minutes is uh, definitely possible to disrupt that fusion so that you can check the maximum deviation how much the eye is deviating without any kind of accommodative component for the or the fusional component for that particular patient is it clear yes sir it's very clear thank you sir want to add anything in this patching like we used to uh, patch in the rounds uh, till you come so just wanted to dr pradeep sharma can uh, have, no, share his experience i think yes yeah. was correct that in cases of intermittent exotropias there are two situations when we want to know one is to differentiate between the simulated divergence axis and the true divergence axis uh, that is one and the other situation is to know the full amount of exotropia because many a times exotropias when we measure even for distance fixation we may not get the full amount and that's why we have uh, come across people saying that after the surgery also there is a residual exotropia partly because of this reason that the full amount of exotropia was not detected so one mechanism is that you make them fixate at far far distance uh, not just 6 meters but maybe 20 meters or even ask them to look outside the window as they say of the clinic so that is one way of doing it but still that may not fully dissociate the two eyes and so a patch is done so these are the two situations in intermittent exotropias when we may patch and as dr uh, ramesh has said um, i mean for convenience sake we take it 30 minutes although kushner has mentioned 45 minutes in uh, and the older times travel small just have mentioned even 24 hours of patch uh, which was mentioned but usually we find that a 30 minute patch would bring out the difference between a simulated and a true divergence axis and that should serve the purpose so but yes and that's another thing like we don't differentiate whether we have to patch the good eye or the uh, deviating eye it is breaking the fusion so any one eye when you patch the fusion will be broken the same way so i think that is the important thing i think dr ramesh has very nicely put up the uh, presentation on the observation i mean we would like to have some more questions if there are in that yes uh, how do we rule out head posture due to refractive error okay refractive error is uh, mostly by exclusion okay refractive error there are two situations which will come to you for example a patient is already wearing glasses and patient is not wearing glasses so what is the checklist i will do is uh, patch one eye whenever the patient has abnormal head posture patch one eye see whether it is going or not both related to ocular and the refractive error it will go once you patch one eye or occlude one eye but the second thing what you have to do is uh it's a little bit difficult to really demonstrate in the clinic because with the occlusion or a pin hole if it is related to refractive error it will go but the refractive error related abnormal head posture is uh, i would not say it's very common it's usually exclusion i would say most common cause either it could be strabismus ptosis nystagmus these are the top priority i would look into then comes maybe a pattern or v pattern or any kind of falsies like superior oblique falsies that's the next three set of things what i would see if it is something vestibular or skew deviation or anything like that usually they won't come to us i am talking about a practical situation theoretically anything can happen 
I am seeing what can happen in a routine clinical situation is if they are really sick, Q deviations can be there with the vestibular or other things. In spite of this, if you rule out, ruled out strabismus, cover test, absolutely ortho in all positions of gaze. This is very important. All positions of gaze, orthotropic, no nystagmus, no lid drooping, pupils are okay. Obviously, no visual field defects, no pallor or anything, because sometimes even a visual field defect, patients can have their abnormal head posture. These are all we have to do, should not conclude at the beginning. We need to come to this kind of exclusion one by one. In spite of that, if I can't find anything, then if I see whether the patient has refractive error. I have seen uh, refractive error causing abnormal head posture in oblique astigmatisms and in hyper hypertropias, hyper in the sense, hypermetropias, severe hypermetropias, especially when they look down, they accommodate more. Usually they try to put like this, their head. Once you give glasses, that's what even I showed it in the poster also. When you give glasses, they become all right. Not typical myopia, all these things will not lead to uh, a kind of abnormal head posture. It's, it's a long answer, but I would say you need to come to a conclusion by ruling out everything else. There is no one recipe like do a cover test, you have ruled out refractive error. No, just Dr. to add uh, on that, sometimes yes. people who are wearing uh, corrections and they have become uh, like uh, undercorrected, they start peeping from the side because the uh, side of the glasses is going to give them a little more refractive effect. So the prismatic effect is more. So many children, if they are wearing even myopic or hypermetropic correction, when they start peeping from the side, it may be the reason that they are undercorrected and it's time for them to change the glasses. So that's another uh, situation which may become. Very, very valid point, uh, Dr. Sharma. And also in uh, pseudo fake patients or fake patients, if the correction of hypermetropia is too much, they again try to do that. Exactly. And if you are given prescription, which is too much for the child, again, they will do this. So this is what I just wanted to share. After giving refractory erection, error correction also, they can have abnormal red posture as I showed in the, the scratch on the glasses. When you put occlusion in one eye, also she had, because she had a window of seeing in one corner. And then in the clinic, you can say that we did everything. Obviously, in the clinic only, we checked the, the glasses, which generally people should have a habit of checking the glasses. What's the condition, especially in children? So that also is important. After refractive error correction also, people can have abnormal head posture. But common things, think about common things first. Uh, Dr. Amitava, can you share your experience with head turns and tilts in your daily? No, Dr. Ramesh has covered up uh, pretty very well, in fact. And Dr. Sharma has added uh, whatever few gaps were there. Just one thing, when you get people with head posture, I tell my student that... Uh, you see, there is some gain for that uh, ch uh, child, that some that person. He may or she may be uh, straight-eyed with that head posture. And it may be just a very feeble fusion. And, you know, there is a tendency in students to straighten out the head in the primary case. And then this fusion may actually break at that point of time. And it may not recover during the time the child is in your clinic. So I always tell them here, don't have to touch the child. Let's gain, get all the positives that are there. If the child is in alignment with that house posture, he's fusing. These are positive. Such a person, when we and if we do plan a surgical intervention, is more likely to you know get, get a happy ending because he's demonstrating a binocular function. So that's about uh, one thing I I thought uh, we should tell uh, these students that you don't have to straighten out the person all the time. Uh, you know when they come with head posture. In fact, the the moment the child walks into the clinic. He is the most attentive at that time because he is maybe a little scared, a little anxious. So at that time, you should not miss the opportunity because that time he is uh, going to have a head posture. The best uh, window for observing would be that time, especially people who have nystagmus. I mean, you would see them when they are coming in, they would have it or you have to wait for the uh, very fine line on the smellance to make them read. 
otherwise you may not get the complete head posture so you have to be very observant as i generally say the recipe in strabismus is o c i p e observation as dr ramesh mentioned uh, today i mean is that's the first leg so you have to have very keen observation but then that has to be coupled with confirmation by your simple tests like cover test you talked about and the other things which we may be using like spielmanns or pluter or whatever then third comes the inference and then is the planning and ex execution so it's o c i p e this is the five pronged approach which we uh, recommend for strabismus but the first thing most important is observation because children may not give you another chance so you have to be very uh, observant in the first time when the child comes into your clinic and observe and then note that point thank you sir uh, the next question is uh, does dilation of pupil alter the interpretation of hirschberg corneal reflex test and how reliable is it yeah dilatation is um, it can affect but you then you need to imagine what's the part of center part of the you know pupil uh, this is usually a reason to you know say that okay come on another day pupil <laughs> is dilated okay that's a common thing but i would say you can still get some information uh, even in a dilated uh, patient uh, kind of how much is the deviation whether it is exotropia or isotropia we can definitely make out pupil is dilated instead of 3 mm it's around 7 or 8 mm you can still imagine because we have seen a lot of eyes we know where is the position it's going to be and it's not a measurement where you have to do a surgery i will never do a surgery but for a diagnostic purpose it's still good enough i cannot do the strabismus evaluation for near not possible pupil is dilated they can't even accommodate for for the distance both in a sensory case or in a patient with both eyes vision you can just do an evaluation for diagnostic purpose i would say not beyond that you can pupil is dilated so what you can do still ocular motility right you can still rule out duvan syndrome you can still rule out brown syndrome with that normal head posture they coming like that so it can be still diagnostic but not therapeutic but i agree there is a situation where a intermittent exotropia comes i need to know what's the control all that but you can fairly get a good idea about what is happening to the patient i would not rely and do anything any intervention without doing a uh, you know undilated check for a strabismus evaluation limited information can be still got i mean this is a generalization that dr ramesh was talking about about the pupil in any case you would uh, remember that pupil size is not going to be the same if there is a lighter iris person he would have a little a more dilated pupil it may be around 4 or 5 mm whereas another person may have 3 mm but here we are more often going by the millimeters of separation from the center or a slight off center that we it is it's not exactly center but slight off center that the uh, reflex comes the uh, light reflex so we will be talking about the difference between the limbus and this point in terms of millimeters but this is not exact grad uh, gradation for the purpose of surgery but more for maybe in children sometimes we may use that but not for but by the way pupillary dilatation is definitely a no no when you want to make an examination of the eye for strabismus because then the fixation becomes affected so if a, a person is coming with dilated pupils you would have to schedule a visit another day in order to have a proper measurement of deviation because at that time his accommodation would be affected his ability to fix it would be affected so you will have a difficulty in taking measurements so that Dr. is amitava had a point I, yeah, i just wanted to say that when i am doing it in the clinic i mean where, where people have been posted to pick up strabismus points i actually force force them to say i want you to tell me how many millimeters off the center uh, do you feel it is and we turn them put a scale next to the patient to see you should and i let them ask them to look at a scale to know, to remind them of how much is a millimeter actually you know we tend to forget uh, how much is a millimeter on the cornea and then you know i tell them see look a cornea itself is a scale of about 10 mm so make a best guess that okay it seems to be 1 mm off is it 2 mm off and try to associate it with the millimeter not just with the pupillary edge correct yes that's a nice point 
for uh, squint evaluation in kids can krimsky be done as a primary evaluation and if yes how young you can do uh, as young as 3 or 4 months if they have a uh, congenital strabismus because of duvan or things like that we can also uh, do in even in older patients but as they get uh, older it becomes uh, difficult especially in toddlers they don't like anything coming in front of their eyes so still uh, you can just get one uh, in infants and toddlers it's a different ball game don't expect okay i will make the child sit like this straight let me do hushback then let me do uncover it's not going to work when you are dealing with an infant and toddler inspection i i think for me the inspection and ocular motility becomes very very crucial then after everything just come back and sit and have a conversation with the parent come back and when the child is looking at you judging at you what is he is not a harmful person let me go and put the prism once just measure how much it is come back take 10 second don't check okay let me do that's not possible so you need to time the uh, examination in a toddler and infants it's not that uh, you may be able to do continuously sometimes you have to put the child on the shoulder of the mother and then go back and from there you can do the crimps cases so it's a little bit of a tricky thing like you do a refraction in an infant and toddler very similar way even the strabismus but you can get a fairly i would say fairly good estimation of the amount of deviation by doing a crimps cases even if they have good vision in both eyes Uh, Dr. Ramita and Dr. Sharma, you have any other points and tricks yeah, to yeah. add to that? I do want to uh, add. You know, I, I think uh, we don't have electricity, so I have come down to my lamp on the on the inverter. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, so one trick is, you see, when you have an apprehensive toddler who's really, uh, you know, worried, whatever you want to do, it's it's. I sometimes do it on the mother. You know, I take that instrument and do it on the mother. That reassures the child very often, and then you know they're more receptive to me doing the same thing on them. so that is a little trick which i think people can try uh, you know when they they are dealing with apprehensive little kids so uh, how how reliable is hirsch uh, hirschberg test over pbct in younger kids for a- never never 100% never it's it's doable uh, i would say maybe infant and toddler if you do a strabismus surgery 30 to 40% of the kids will be based on krimsky and hirschberg test in the true sense it just not possible to accurately do a complete assessment that's why even if it is hirschberg is such an old test still it has got some value in these kind of situations what is again required is like in them what do we do surgery wise most often it's a infantile esotopia surgery or any kind of esotopia surgery is the most common we do very rarely we do some kind of duan syndrome surgery maybe some nystagma surgery so if you take the infantile esotopia we need to have usually it is between 30 to 40 or 45 one size never fits all but most of the times it fits to that particular patient because we still want a little bit of under correction so if you ask me direct answer is no it is never same but it is feasible and possible in infants to uh, decide our therapeutic dose depending upon the krimsky test uh, dr sharma and dr amita will have more experience they can share uh, how much percentage of their patients are kids and they do their surgery based on this so i think we have to go by the prism bar cover test in most of the cases whenever feasible even in the children whenever we can get hold of the uh, prism bar measurement that is going to be more reliable in let's say a child who is just about 7 months and you have to do a surgery and he doesn't allow the uh, thing then you may go by the hirschberg but yes there is a pinch of salt that you have to remember there have been several studies in order to uh, quantify the hirschbergs and they have all uh, come out with this that it the reliability is not 100% but 
and uh, there now there is another uh, i think revived interest with the gaze tracking uh, studies though the web cameras on that and they, with the gaze tracking they are trying to do it the problem here is that we are trying to see a chord measurement with an arc measurement so that is the reason why there is a fallacy between a hirschberg's and the prism bar covertures because that is a more rotational actual value when we do with the prism bar covertures so the most reliable whenever possible always go by the pvct when you don't have that possibility at all then it's like the lesser evil then you can go with the uh, hirschberg's test the kinski is also actually a modification of hirschberg's mm. Dr. Amitabha, do you want to add anything in this? Like, how do you deal with younger kids in your OPD before surgical evaluation? So is, that's true. What uh, what uh, Professor Sharma and uh, and Dr. Ramesh have said, I would much prefer the prism bar uh, coverted because it gives me more precise measurements, uh, and uh, that's what I want. I mean, I know that now he's uh, seeing with each four year intern with when when we are switching the cover. In these children, uh, you know, we're not very sure uh, this thing, but we. we do have to kind of straighten out the eye in those tiny little kids also because we want to align them as much as we can so there all the neural development proceeds as normally as possible we more often than not succeed because you know we actually put it within the fusional capacity of the child and um, so we we kind of uh, continue to do that but those are uh, uncommon thing very tiny kids kids who can't who won't prefer uh, you know and uh, listen to you it's not easy you know let me tell you uh, when uh, the uh, and the post post graduates because when they go to this orthoptist clinic and when they try they realize that when you are sitting close to the kid you know your face is the most attractive to the kid especially if you are wearing specs and you have mustaches and you have all the funny thing he is not interested in looking at the snellen chart whatever you may have uh, at 6 meters away he is more interested in what what is in your hand and what does your face look like the human face is the most attractive object i have even now started having uh, children look at the mother actually you know i make the mother stand behind my shoulder give the, the kid to the father if possible and let the uh, mother attract the child and then i may do some test to see how is the fixation doing you know using the mother's face as a fixation target you can actually use the fixation uh, animated toys uh, on the screen so you keep changing ask your assistant to keep on changing by the time you are doing and each time there is a new picture popping up the child is curiously looking there so it's an apple a, a turtle or whatever i mean each uh, then he keeps and you can keep on playing and he is interested in the uh, television going on at the far so his interest could be uh, in that thank you so that are such, such good tips to take an examination before surgical evaluation yeah and uh, here i would like to conclude today's session uh, uh, thank you dr ramesh it has been a uh, very uh, nice to he uh, hear uh, such an illustrative session and uh, i am hoping for this uh, second uh, session of our examination and thank you dr pradeep and thank you dr amita and thank you dr santosh for your valuable time and i would also like to thank our two hot seaters today dr soni and dr pravin for making this session interactive and by this i would like to conclude the session and we'll be meeting in the next friday with the examination of squint part 2 by dr ramesh Thank you Asha thank, thank you bye 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 thank you